Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Eastman Chemical Company, ticker EMN. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, we have a market cap of $10 billion, enterprise value of $14 billion, so you see about $3.5 billion in net debt on this business. This is in the chemicals industry, so we can see that debt is taking up about 25% of their balance sheet here. Um, or enterprise value rather. So the Eastman Chemical Company is a specialty materials company that's important because specialty tends to be higher priced. Um, companies, additives and functional products segments, they have hydrocarbon, rosin, resins, has an advanced materials segment, copolyesters, biopolymers, very technical words here. So they're serving medical, pharma, consumables industry, transportation, lots of different industries here. Um, chemical intermediates, serve industrial chemicals process and building construction and agrochemicals in the fiber segments goes into um, in transportation industrial agriculture mining so aerospace so all sorts of different industries that they are serving seems like it's a pretty big company here with 10 billion for chemical company so we have a 1.49 beta it tends to be a higher volatility there again 1.0 is the baseline for an s p 500 company so this is about 50 percent more volatile than your average s p 500 company and when we look at the return on invested capital chart we can see why because very quickly you see the cyclicality in this business you have only one year of loss over the last 20 years, which is pretty good. 19 years of profits out of the last 20 is a good baseline for what I would call a high quality company. However, you can see clear cyclicality in their earnings. You go from losing money in 2003 to making a 17% return on invested capital in 2005, down to 4% in 2009, back up to 19%, down to 7%, up to 14%, and you just have these circular cycles. It looks like waves. When you have a return on invested capital chart that looks like waves like this, that's what the cyclicality is. What you want is 10, 20 years that look like their period from 2014 to 2016, where it's very, very stable. 7.7%, 7.6%, 7.6%. You want a long run of stable earnings like this instead of these up and down cycles because it's very hard to predict as an investor what you're going to get in the future. For instance, we sit here at 7.5%. Is that what I should expect in the future? You had some years much higher than that. You had some years lower than that. It's really hard to tell when you have this cyclical past. Now, what I do like to see here is that they have a return on invested capital of 7.6% over the last 10 years, but they've actually turned that into a 19% return on equity. That's that leverage at work. So you have that $3.5 billion in leverage, boosting the return on invested capital from 7% to 19% for shareholders. That's a really good number. I like this number to be above 15%. Now, ideally, I want less leveraged companies because I would like a 10% return on invested capital to get a 15% plus return on equity. Equity. But for whatever reason, Eastman seems comfortable with a very large amount of debt. And so they're actually leveraging a 7% return on invested capital to triple itself towards that 19% return on equity. So this return on equity makes me excited in the sense that it's above 15%, which is my threshold. I know I'm operating with a little bit more leverage than I would like, but otherwise I'm hitting my metrics for this company in terms of high quality. And again, over the last 18 years in a row, they have made a profit. So that's actually pretty good. Now, the P.E. ratio is also exciting. When you look at this P.E. ratio of 9.2, that's a really good number, and it equates well with the price to book of 2.0. This tells me that things are matching up approximately really nicely. What am I doing here? I'm taking the return on equity of 19%, dividing it by 2, and I approximately get 9.2. That means that my price to earnings are likely not overstated. They're probably in line with historical norms. There's nothing necessarily off about the earnings that I'm seeing here, like it would be if these numbers didn't match up. That means that I can pay an above average price to book because I have such a high return on equity and I'm getting a below 10 PE. Below 10 PEs are really exciting because that means that your current earnings yield is above 10%. This would be an earnings yield of about 11% a year, which means that I'm probably going to average my return somewhere between 11% and 19% if I held this company over the long term. 
And the reason for that is, is that my starting yield starts in the double digit range, which means that assuming the company's not wasting money, assuming they're getting at least a dollar market value for every dollar that they make, then I should receive at least an 11% return when buying this stock. This is a very attractive price, especially for a growing company. The company is growing. They are growing their earnings. They're growing their free cash flow. They're growing their revenue. So I don't have to worry about it from that sense. And so it's an attractive entry price. Normally, I like to buy stocks at a PE of 15 or less, but going below 10 starts to get cheap. And especially with a high return on equity like this, it gets me excited to go into the rest of the company. Now, the 3.9% revenue growth rate is slow. It's not terrible, but they're definitely growing, but it's not going super fast. And what we can see is, is that they have some good years in the past year, but they've gone from 8.1 billion in revenue to about 10, 10 and a half billion in revenue in 2021. Looks like they suffered during COVID. And so without COVID, they would probably be even in an even better spot than they were because we see most of their time they're growing earnings somewhere in the 6% plus range. And so these, these declines here are a little off the normal path. So I'm not super concerned about that over the last two years because of what we would see in the quick recovery in 2021. Um, now, it means that I've only grown my revenue by about 30% over the last decade, but you did grow your gross profit by about 50%, which is attractive. You can see the gross margin's gone from 21% to 23% at the end of the decade, and you've had some operating margin increase as well from 11% to 13.9%. So that operating leverage is really helping you as a shareholder. Now, the EPS growth rate is interesting because you've gone from $2.93 to $6.25. So you've more than doubled. That means you're growing at maybe somewhere in the range of about a 7% growth per year in EPS, I don't really know why it's showing 3.3% based on a quick estimate of the numbers here. Now, it could just be because they're using some a different number for trailing 12 months. I don't really know looking on this on a quick basis. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is you're paying out a decent dividend as well. So the dividend appears to be somewhere in the range of 30 to 40% of the earnings um, each year, and they're still growing at that good pace. That means that you're going to get some of this return back to you as a shareholder while they can still earn this return. Again, because of this high return on equity, they're able to do that, and that really helps you as a shareholder. And you see that the only year that they earned less than a 10% return on equity was 2020. Only year they earned less than 15% was this 2019 and the recovering year of 2021. So that's a good sign for your future as a shareholder. So if you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Ring that bell so you can get notified. I'm uploading new videos each week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, covering new companies. I'm going to start trying to work in some shorts as well on Tuesday and Thursday if I can make it work. So I hope you will subscribe to the channel for that content. Now let's go to the income statement and see what else we can learn. One of the things that's really interesting to me is you can see that they're SGNA has not grown that significantly. I mean, you've gone up maybe 20% on SGNA, and yet you get that 30% growth in revenue. That's allowing you to have this operating profit margin growth. And so I really like to see that in terms of your operating profit growing faster than your gross profit um, because you're not growing your SGNA as quickly. Now, you do see that they are having that significant amount of net interest income, $200 million dollars per year in interest income, which is a significant amount on their balance sheet. Now, we're also getting a decent amount of non-operating income up and down, um, which is causing volatility in these numbers. And so that could be the reason for part some of this volatility here that's not actually an operating basis impact. So it's something to be aware of that it might be best to look on an operating profit line to see that although they are still volatile on the operating profit line, it is less than on the net income line. And that is one reason for that. Another thing that I like to see here is that your shares outstanding have been going down across the decade. So you did increase temporarily from 2012 to 2013, but it looks like from since 2013, they've gone from 157 million down to 137 million. So they've only retired about 10 to 15%, maybe somewhere in that 10% range of shares outstanding. So it's not a huge amount of buybacks across the decade, but it adds about 1% per year to your EPS growth, which is encouraging. What I also like to see is you see this $6.25 in 2021 that they earn, but they're learning a lot more 
more than that going into the last 12 months, it's looking like $9 EPS, which is very significant. So that's really driving this really attractive stock price. So you like to see that sort of growth. It means that you're basically tripling your earnings over the course of a decade. And if you triple your earnings over the course of a decade, you're not earning you know, 3% EPS growth, like it says, you're not earning 7% EPS growth, which would be about um, doubling every decade. You're more on track for something like a 12% EPS growth when you triple in a decade. So that's really attractive. Balance sheet. So PP&E is up about 50%. And that's not too bad because, again, you've grown your earnings much faster than that. It looks like you had a big jump here in 2012. They probably did an acquisition. Let's skip over to cash flow. Yeah, you can see the acquisition here of $2.6 So that grew their asset base there very quickly. Um, Long-term debt has tripled, but it looks like they went up a lot with this acquisition. And then since 2014, they've really been paying down their debt. So that's made it, they're really cutting that interest cost for you. That's an encouraging thing for a shareholder because it means that as interest rates rise, they've already been paying down their debt. So you're not expected to have a massive influx of new interest rates because they do seem like they're interested in paying down their debt. Um, it's a good good use of their capital there. Um, one of the things that I like about this company compared to many companies that I've seen in this industry or other capital intensive industries is that their depreciation tends to match their PP and E growth here. You see this 465, 360, 433, 483, um, 652, 571. It's not that far off. You're talking about 10 to 20% higher instead of like double. I mean, look at this 2021 number, 538 in depreciation, 555. They actually bought, built less out in 2019 and 2021. A lot of times when I look at these depreciation numbers, they're understating future CapEx, and yet this time they're much more in line with that. That means I can give a little bit more faith to the net income number than I would otherwise with companies like this normally. So that's an encouraging sign. I like seeing that they're buying back stock each and every year. That's also good. And they've been paying down debt. So sometimes you get these companies and they've been buying back stock, but they're issuing debt or they're paying dividends, but they're issuing debt. But you can see that they've been bought back. They've been paying down their debt every year since 2015 while paying dividends, while pay, buying back shares. What this shows us is that the free cash flow is real. They truly have free cash flow from this business and they're able to pay it out to shareholders while still growing the business. Very, very good sign for shareholders for something to be excited about with this type of company because it means management is making intelligent capital allocation decisions. They have free cash flow and not only do they have free cash flow, but they are paying it out to shareholders. One of the reasons they're able to do this is because of that high return on equity. When you have a return on equity in this 20% range, but you're only growing four, five, 6% a year, you're able to retain only a small percentage of your earnings are necessary in order to continue growing. Maybe you retain 25% of your earnings, but you're able to pay out the other 75%. And that's a really good setup for strong shareholder returns. So this company is actually in a really interesting spot. Um, because they have an attractive return on equity, they have intelligent capital allocation, and they have a really good price. I think Eastman Chemical is at a is should be something that should be considered for people's um, portfolios who want something in the chemical industry, who want to diversify into some sort of industrial manufacturing type business. Now, one of my largest positions is already a manufacturer. So for me, it's not going to be a company I buy simply because of diversification reasons. I have over half my portfolio in a company that is dedicated to the industrial industry already. And so for me, it would be something that doesn't go in my portfolio, but it's actually a really interesting setup for many investors that don't already have something like that because they have this really high return on equity. Again, 15% plus is what I look at. They have a really attractive price. 10, 10 or less is something that's really interesting. And they've been growing pretty sustainably in the mid single digit range while translating that to an EPS growth above 10%. Very attractive numbers when you can triple your earnings over the course of a decade while paying down up dividends, while buying back shares, while um, 
paying down your debt. To do all that at once is a very interesting setup. And so I think Eastman Chemical Company is something that is worth considering for investors. I hope you would learn something from this. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Ring that bell so you can get notified when I upload new videos. And if you like this software, if you want to study companies the way I'm doing it here in this video, then use the first link in the description below. That's my affiliate link to quickfs.net. You can sign up for a free or a paid account. And when you do so, I can get a commission for sending you to that software program. This is the software I love to use myself. It's very good at doing a quick 5, 10, 15 minute analysis on a company that gives you all their metrics in a quick, easy to use format. I hope you'll check it out. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.